Hey y'all, it's True of You, right here, with another top 10 list, and it's that time of year again. 2017 is close to closing, and I don't think we can let this year end without True of You's pick for this year's worst games to have been released. But before we kick off, let's discuss the rules of engagement. Firstly, and it goes without saying, only games to have been released this year counts, so any major updates on ongoing, older games don't count. Any games that have been released via Steam from amateur indie teams or devs don't count as they could take the entire list if they wanted to, considering how many shit titles have been released over there in the last year. And finally, the elephant in the room. Bad business practices such as microtransactions, loot boxes and any other system that is designed to get money from the player is a valid reason for being on this list as I honestly believe that it affects the overall quality and meaning of a game. So with all that out of the way, let's find out what's in at number 10. Double Dragon 4 It's a shame that this happens because Double Dragon was loads of fun back in the day. However, in hindsight, most of us can agree that the controls weren't anything special. We can forgive those older games for this because it was to be expected in the 90s as bad controls weren't really a thing. But with time, we can now see that some of those games of old controlled terribly, and thus a new entry into the series, with retro graphics, would have to include a better control system. Not the same, Double Dragon. Not the bloody same. This game controls awfully, with stiff movement controls, terrible hitbox detection, and gameplay that just feels slow and cumbersome. I'm sure that there are many people out there that would love to see Double Dragon make a comeback, but not like this. One, two, Switch. Despite the success that the Nintendo Switch has been seeing, also f Nintendo, I guess they're not even a commercially successful console nowadays, can't escape from gimmicky launch titles. If there's anything we learnt from the Wii U, it's that gamers hate shoveled in gimmicks. But I'm guessing that Nintendo were the only ones not to receive the memo. 1-2 Switch was just that. It was a hardware demo. Hey, look what this new system can do! Never mind the game itself, oh no! All families and friends want to do is to swoon over the new console and pretend to do stuff that they can do in real life. Look, it's like I'm cradling a baby! Never mind the actual babies crying in the next room. Look at all these things I can do that I couldn't do in real life. What's that? Breath of the Wild? Yeah, not interested. I'm busy making it look like I'm deep throating a cock. Mass Effect Andromeda! While well, I'll be the first to admit that it's not a terrible game in any way, it's certainly not a good game either. I'd even go so far as to say that it's not an alright game too. I gave this one a 4 out of 10 in my rant video a while ago, and I'm sticking to that religiously. Bioware fucked this one up in my own opinion. They shouldn't have made it. Mass Effect 1 was good. Mass Effect 2 was great. Mass Effect 3 was also pretty good, but had a terrible ending. But all in all, I was relatively happy with the trilogy. However, I also felt that Mass Effect was a franchise that should be left alone. Any further entries into this series would have run the risk of bringing a bad name to something that most of us have fond memories of. Thanks Mass Effect Andromeda for ruining those memories. Because now when I hear the name Mass Effect, I'm thinking of a rush job that added nothing to the series, an empty universe with soulless characters bumbling about in it, and the image of Sarah Ryder's face. Now, whether this game was heavily influenced by feminists, or if this was just an anti-SJW conspiracy, this game was thrown out the door long before it was finished, and naturally, received a lukewarm reception. In response to this, Bioware have promised to not clean up their own mess, leaving the future of this franchise hanging in the balance. We saw this coming, Bioware, but you were adamant about making it. Bubsy, the Woolly Strike Back. Okay, stop a second. Who the f asked for this? Was it you? Or you? Yes, you, I'm talking to you right now. Did you ask for this to be made? 
One of the best things about life in general is that sometimes you just cannot predict what's going to happen. And I find myself being reminded of this with the new Bubsy game. Bubsy 3D came out back in 1996, and since then, it has been widely considered one of the worst games of all time. It was so bad that it killed the franchise off, presumably for good. That was until in October of this year, when someone went and revived the franchise with a new title. But unlike any true underdog story, this new title was also bad. Though not on the same level of bad as the 1996 game was, this one was still bad enough to remind us that the Bubsy franchise is something that's not worth spending any of your money on. With finicky controls, copy and paste generic levels, along with the suspicious smell of reused assets, Bubsy the Woolly Strike Back unfortunately did not strike back into the gaming community. Vaccine! Before ripping into this one, I would like to start off by acknowledging and praising the idea behind it. Vaccine is a game that attempted to recapture the feel of the original Resident Evil, and on the surface, it looks to do just that. But wade in a little further and you'll find that there's not much to like about this one. Because for all of Resi 1's flaws, it didn't have a fucking timer on it! And as we saw with Double Dragon 4, older games got away with bad controls because that's all they had to work with back then. Or at the very least, they didn't know any better. That's not the same nowadays, so if you release a game with shit controls today, everyone is going to notice the shit controls. Silent Hill 1 had shit controls, but you don't hear anyone aside from me saying it. But if that game was released today, it'd be considered a joke. A joke of which Vaccine is now the centre of. In short, Vaccine reminds us of the likeable aspects of old school gaming for only a brief moment, before reminding us of the unlikable aspects for the rest of the game. Siberia 3! Oh, f me. It's taken you all this long to finally get on the same page as me, has it? I've been saying that the Siberia franchise was crap for many years now, but it's only now that you're all starting to think that way too? Oh, what's that? Siberia 3 was dull, was it? Oh, come on. You must have thought that it was nice and had a lovely atmosphere and invokes early 90s gaming nostalgia in you? Surely? No? Because none of that excuses the fact that the story was dull, the characters were dull, the voice acting was bad, and it was over too quickly? Hmm, now where have I heard that before? I mean, it's not like any of the previous Siberia games did that now, is it? In all honesty, I haven't played this game and have no intention of doing so. Because after playing both 1 and 2 and feeling that they were both a waste of time, number 3 would most likely have been the exact same, but maybe with some different graphics. And after reading the reviews on it and watching some Let's Plays, I can now say the following. Siberia 3 is a waste of time like its predecessors, but with some different graphics. Glad we're on the same page now, for fuck's sake. Drive Girls! Oh my god, really? True of you is a massive weeaboo. Get the fuck out right now! No, wait, we've already done that in a past video. And no, I'm not here to say this game was good. Go and remind yourself of the title of this video real quick, because I'm about to poo all over this one. The trouble with a front cover that has anime girls wearing close to nothing and holding huge weapons on it is that it looks like it could be fun. Drive Girls, on the other hand, isn't. It's essentially a car combat game where you go around beating other characters and different groups up as either a girl or a car. Because as it turns out in this game, these girls can transform into cars. And that's all well and good. Well, it's not. But as it turns out, the handling of these cars is just the worst. If I were to drive a car that handled like this in real life, then I'd be taking it to the nearest garage to get fixed. It also appears that these girls move like they're drunk, if they really do have the power to turn into cars. Perhaps they should get a driver's license before activating this power. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Mega Battle 
Between 2015 and 2016, social media was in an uproar after one of the most advanced AI robots did a tour of the world, showcasing how much we've come in terms of artificial intelligence technology. Being called Sophia, the AI demonstrated that modern technology was capable of reading, understanding, and displaying human emotions, as well as developing its own personality and, to some extent, having its own ideas and preferences. But don't worry, because our faith in humanity was then drop-kicked back into the depths of the ocean in 2017, when Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Mega Battle showcased some of the most mindless AI we've ever seen. Most enemies won't even try bother looking for you or follow you around the screen. It's like they've been programmed to enter the level, close their eyes, and then mindlessly flail about the place and hopefully land a hit on you in the process. You could quite literally go off to one side of the screen and just stand there as the enemy ahead of you attacks thin air, wondering why they're not doing any damage to the player. Ultimately, the gameplay is rendered into a lazy joke, while the bigger encounters are reduced to quick time events. Mega Battle? More like half assed beta. Vroom in the night sky. It's Superman 64 on the Switch. That's basically it. Each map is huge and filled with absolutely fing nothing. There's nothing to do except from going from point A to point B and maybe flying through a ring in midair. That's the game. I've nothing else to say about it because I've quite literally just covered it all. In fact, if you want to know everything about this game, then just look at the title. That name alone tells you everything you can do in this one. And when the novelty of going vroom in the night sky wears off, there's always the quit option to try out. Another one bites the dust. Another one bites the dust. Star Wars Battlefront 2! Most certainly the most controversial entry on this list, and many of you will be divided on this one, but this is my own opinion after all, so just leave an angry comment and move on. But Star Wars Battlefront 2 is, in my opinion, the epitome of everything that's wrong with the AAA market right now. EA surprised us a little after Battlefront 1 came out. They put their hands up and said, we kinda f***ed up on that one. Now, Battlefront 1 wasn't particularly great, but it certainly wasn't a bad game. It was hugely unfinished and required a season pass to get the full content, which is f***ing disgusting in itself. So surely they would have learned their lesson on that one and made improvements when it came to Battlefront 2. What we ended up getting is quite frankly the most insulting excuse for a video game of this generation. When the likes of Persona 5 had come out and showed us that awesome premium games that don't constantly ask for money to be played can still make a f**k ton of cash, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a mediocre pew pew experience that aggressively demands that you fork over a regular stream of cash just to be able to be enjoyed, despite already having paid a premium price up front just to get access to it. Any free to play game can kind of get away with microtransactions and the occasional loot box because they have to pay for the server's upkeep in some way. And naturally, those who help make the game are entitled to some financial compensation for their work. After all, you can't expect a company to survive if they're asking their employees to work long hours for no money. But when you release a game at full price, with most of the content locked off, where the only advantage you can get over other players who already have spent a lot of money for better weapons and upgrades, is to spend loads of money yourself, and where the game constantly reminds you that the only way to get better is to gain currency, of which the only true way of getting some is by spending real money, then surely... Just surely. The main reason why EA made this game was to make money and damn the player? Everything about Battlefront 2 revolves around spending as much money on it as possible. The more you spend on it, the more you'll get rewarded, and the more you'll enjoy it. So in the end, what we're left with is a game that doesn't care if it's good or not. This isn't a game that was made to be good. It's a game that was made to make EA rich at the expense of their target audience. And when you show this level of contempt towards your targeted audience, they're only going to start pushing back. Star Wars Battlefront 2 might as well be EA's PayPal account, with a mediocre FPS minigame being found on the same webpage to keep you entertained while your donations to them is getting processed. A game which many have also cited as being bugged, laggy, and with not much change from before. 
And so, for being the single most insulting game of recent memory, possibly of all time, Star Wars Battlefront 2 by Electronic Arts takes the number one entry on True Review's Top 10 Worst Games of 2017 list by f***ing miles. And that's it, but if you're the most insulting person of 2017, then like this video and subscribe to this channel. Don't forget that I'm on Twitter under True Review, where you can find out which video is up next and when it'll be out, and I'm also on Patreon where you can spend all of your money on me without the hassle of receiving weapon upgrades or a pink Darth Vader costume. But unfortunately, there's no pew pewing over there either. But anyway, I'm out of here, and I'll catch you all next year. So until then, for the last time in 2017, see ya!